Okay. Okay, I guess I'll st I'll start from from the uh, the beginning then. Um, my involvement in criminology really started. Uh, it would have been back in the early nineties. I um, was an undergraduate at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And a lot like the students that we have here at, at Greenwich, uh, the programs that we have here, we had a placement year that we had to do when we were doing a degree in psychology. And a lot of my colleagues, uh, the, the other students, took placements within the Department of, of Psychology. And back in those days, it was still uh, acceptable to do things to animals that maybe we wouldn't think are acceptable today. So it, it did involve doing things like training pigeons and so forth. And, and just by chance, I was allocated, my placement was to the Hamilton Psychiatric Hospital. Um, and I was there under the um, supervision of a forensic psychiatrist uh, whose name was strangely Dr. Ferenz in a forensic psychiatr a psychiatrist. And Dr. Harry Miller, who was a psychologist um, who had been trained in the uh, Freudian ways, uh, which was very interesting. But through my exposure to working there, and it was only a single locked door, but it was seeing um, people who were in really uh, suffering mental illnesses, um, looking at their relationship with the criminal justice system. It's really when I decided that, that criminology would be a, a way forward. Um, or more more accurately, sort of criminology and psychology together. But back back in the early 90s, there, there weren't criminology programs, there weren't criminology master's programs. Um, so I continued to work at the psychiatric hospital for a couple of years uh, before coming to the University of Cambridge here in England. Uh, I was very lucky to be offered a place on the MPhil program and even luckier to be supervised by David Farrington, who is the leading criminologist in the world and has actually now won the Stockholm Prize in Criminology, which is the, the greatest prize a criminologist can get. Um, and that was really the, um, the start of, of my, my real criminology career. So in the process of doing my MPhil, I, I, because I wanted to please one of the most famous criminologists in the world, I said, I'll do whatever you want for a master's course. And he gave me some data from the Pittsburgh Youth Study, which is a, a prospective longitudinal study following up kids from a very young age in, in Pittsburgh up to up to the age of about 18 at that time. And we looked at the concentration of offending in families. So how if your mother has committed an offense, it makes you more likely to commit an offense or if your father has. But because this Pittsburgh Youth Study was so fantastic, we could see that if your grandparent had committed an offense, you were more likely to commit an offense. If your aunt or uncle had committed an offense. And to the best of my recollection, the same sex relationships were a lot stronger. So if your father had committed an offense, it was a lot, you as a, as a boy were more likely to commit an offense. Whereas if a mother had committed an offense, a daughter was more likely to commit an offense. But coming to the end of the MPhil, um, David Farrington asked me if I'd like to do a PhD. And I was really at a loss of what, I, what, what should I do? But I was really fortunate. I, my first friend in England, her name was Helen Arnold. Um, she had done some research where she'd administered an empathy questionnaire to violent people in prison, people who were serving sentences for violent offenses, and those who were serving sentences for nonviolent offenses. And that was her MPhil. It was really good, much better than mine, I'd say. Um, but she wasn't able to carry on with that research. But we talked about it in the pub a number of times. Um, and it really got me interested in a, the concept of empathy and also all the potential problems with the research that she'd carried out. Because we know now that people who are serving time in, in prison for violent offenses, they have a long history of, of nonviolent offenses as well. In fact, they're more likely to have nonviolent offenses in their background than violent. Similarly, people serving time for nonviolent offenses, they may have committed a violent offense and plea bargained down to serving time for a nonviolent offense. And that really launched my, my interest in empathy as a, uh, as, as a potential explanation for what's going on with crime. When um, I did start this PhD, what I proposed to do was, because of this problem of, of an official label of offense, offenses, was to look at, to, to think, well, let's look at self-reported offending. That's asking people what they've actually done rather than what they've been caught doing. Um, and I decided that the other thing that would be of real interest was to look at um, children, so people who are younger, earlier stages, because we again, we know that the peak age of offending is about 18, 19, and then it goes down after that. 
Um, and so for my PhD, I went out and ministered questionnaires in, in schools, looking at um, the relationship between empathy and people's self-reported offending. Um, and I guess it's worthwhile now talking about, about just taking a, a step back, I've been talking about um, what empathy is, what we think it is, um, and it really is uh, an interesting concept because we tend to think of it as, a, as an individual difference. Somebody has more, somebody has less, and it's a very simplistic, um, very simplistic relationship that people think empathy has with offending. People on the street think that, you know, if somebody commits violence, they must have low empathy. And people who give a lot of money to charity, they have high empathy. But it's really, really not that simple at all. So you then um, launched into researching about empathy particularly, or was it more towards the relationship between the crime and... Well, I, I think one of the first things I did in starting a PhD, one of the first things I tell all my students to do is do a literature review. And so the, the big question that launched that literature review was, do offenders have less empathy than non-offenders? And so you search the literature and there's all sorts of studies where people have gone into prisons and given these empathy questionnaires, these pieces of paper to offenders and found usually schools, people who are in university to fill in the questionnaire as well and compare the results of these two empathy questionnaires and say offenders have lower empathy or there's not significantly different. And because I found such inconsistent results, some studies showed that people who were non-offenders had much higher empathy than non-offenders. Sorry, that non-offenders had much higher empathy than offenders. Some studies found no difference. And one study that still sticks in my mind showed that offenders had higher empathy than non-offenders. Mm -hmm. So I had to find some way of integrating all that literature. And back in the early 2000s, something that was very popular, still used now, is called systematic reviews, where you systematically look at the literature, make sure it's a a replicable process about the studies that you include, you're very specific about what you include, and you take some of the mathematics and statistics that are involved in each of these studies and put them together in a way that gives you an overall picture. And that actually turned out to be um, the first chapter of my PhD. It's also turned out to be a publication that is now one of the most highly cited publications that I have, something like 850 citations uh, of people um, who have, have used that to, to, to move their research forward. Um, but the ultimate result of that is fairly unsatisfying, actually, because we find that in some cases, offenders have low empathy than, than non-offenders. But the people who were considered offenders in these studies were almost always in prison. Mm. Now, in my career subsequently, I've had a lot of opportunity to be in prison, and they're not the most empathy-inducing environments, to be completely honest. Also, what we need to think about is, you know, by the time somebody reaches prison, they have committed an offense, they've been convicted, and now they're serving time in prison. And by measuring somebody's empathy at that point, it's very mm -hmm. distant from the time yeah. that they've actually committed committed an offense. So is that the reason why you are called empathy guy? Is, is it the right term to use? I, I think I'm probably <laughs> one of the empathy guys. <laughs> I think that there are, obviously there are people who are, are, are um, well known for empathy as well. Probably the most famous is the, the fellow at Cambridge, um, whose name is Cohen, Baron Cohen. Yes, Sasha uh, Cousins. Sasha yes, yes, Baron, yes. Baron Cohen's cousin. And he, okay. he's done some fantastic work. Uh, he tends to come at it more from a clinician's point of view because I, I believe he's a psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, but again, he's, he's devised uh, interesting measures of empathy and he has a very sensible approach to empathy as well. Um, his work is his work is very good. Um, I think it's because I did the systematic review, which has been highly cited, and as a result of finding that some of the the real issues that we had with empathy were in the measure, I then came up with a measure as part of my PhD called the Basic Empathy Scale, and that has been used a great deal in criminology, um, in psychology more generally, and in all sorts of different studies. Um, and as a result, it's, it's, it's expanded from being just, uh, you know, do offenders have different measures of empathy to, you know, shouldn't empathy be raised after or studies or where we intervene with people to increase their levels yeah. of, of caring for others. So this is an interesting point when you said that how they measured the empathy mm -hmm. when they were in prison. And I think, I guess you've been looking at the 
people before maybe some of the, well not the same people but you have looked at a lot of people who you think are potentially prone to going to jail and then you have looked at the people who are now in jail mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's a huge difference and also a huge difference in the environment and according to your experience do you think that um, we are so flexible in our behavior and we adopt to things and in the prison what kind of environment it is it is no uh, i would say a surprise that of course the empathy goes down so much because you're dealing with that kind of environment it's very true um i think the the um one of the more humorous stories i can relay about being in prison that 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 touches on that is when i was speaking to someone in prison who had been punished so had some privileges taken away in in prison and when I asked him why he had been punished, he said, well, you know, the prison guards said that I was hanging around with the wrong crowd in prison. And he looked at me and said, who am I supposed to hang around with? Everybody in here is a criminal. <laughs> and that just That's makes the point. People need to be very careful in prison about these sorts of things. So measuring empathy in prison, you need to be very careful about it. Um, which is why as part of the PhD, what I did was administer empathy questionnaires to kids who were age, exactly the age my son is mm -hmm. now, 15, 16, oh, sorry, between 14 and 15, closer to, closer to 15, um, and asked them a range of questions about, about empathy, about um, self-reported offending, and also about school bullying. It's, it's worth, um, I, I didn't have a particular interest in school bullying, but I found there was a lot of... Um, hesitation by schools to acknowledge that there may be self-reported offending in their schools. So I said I was going to be undertaking a study of, of empathy and, and bullying, mm -hmm. and all schools are required to report their, their levels of bullying. So I did that as well. And I found a very interesting result with empathy and bullying, and one that's been, been replicated. So I have some, some confidence that it's the correct finding, or at least onto the correct finding. And that is that people who have low cognitive empathy and cognitive empathy is the ability to understand people's emotions so so there are different different type of empathies yes Let's, i mean so okay. the, 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 so that's that's interesting so most of us just think oh yeah this is empathy and this is just one good thing it just en encompass everything compassion sympathy and it's just everything is one thing so i guess but there isn't i think there are different types of empathy there are categories yeah i think it's obviously a hard one, and lots of academics will argue about where we draw the boundaries, different terms for the same thing. A lot of academic careers have been made by <laughs> making up your own word for something that already exists, making your own scale, and, and going with that. I hope I haven't done that, but maybe I have. Um, I think where to start with that is probably um, there's a really interesting piece of research that I found in, in looking at empathy, and it, it was from 19... 18 from a fellow by the name of E. E. Southard, um, and he was talking about empathy um, as it was understood at the time. He provides a, a really interesting background of it. Originally, empathy is the, a, a term, a German term, comes from a German term called Einfühlung, which is to feel into, um, and it was actually um, the British slash American psychologist Titchener who coined the term empathy. But back in 1917, 18, 19, this was all about how you experienced art. So there's very interesting mm. descriptions of people <clears throat> having empathy with fish, for example. So Titchener has a very interesting sort of few lines talking about how he felt himself into this picture of a fish, how he was feeling the water over him and the scales and so forth. But that's where empathy first come fr came from. Um, but what um, Southard really documented, which I found was really interesting, was exactly the point you just made, which is, what is empathy? Is it a, a cognitive process? That is something that we understand about someone's emotions. Is it the experience of someone else's emotions? So, and to what extent is sympathy similar to empathy? And very interestingly, even back in 1918, he, he drew a very clear distinction between empathy, ex actually experiencing the emotions of another person, and sympathy, which he felt was actually experiencing the emotions of another person and having some sort of a, an emotional reaction to that. So if you see someone begging on the street, you would 
feel bad for the situation that they're in and you would provide them with you would, you would give people some change but empathy is actually experiencing excuse me affective empathy is actually experiencing the emotions of another person if someone else is fearful you experience mm. that fear if someone else is angry you actually experience that anger whereas cognitive empathy is looking at somebody who is angry and saying that person is angry mm. being able to identify and understand those emotions so if to give an example affect empathy would be something which you have with your family and loved ones someone close to you generally if it's if you, if you want to make it very clear well yeah affective empathy is very much about experiencing the emotions of another person in that context so you would you would be more likely and i think the research evidence is is clear on that right. you would be more likely to have affective empathy with people that you care about actually experiencing the emotions of your children of your parents of those people that are close to you, your friends you may be less likely to experience affective empathy with those people who are more distant from you but there is a real argument in the literature that affective empathy is something that is is almost like a trait something that we're born with we have varying levels that start early in life and that's the affective empathy that, that we have it's it's a trait whereas cognitive empathy the ability to understand the emotions is something that we attempt to train in children so if your child at a at a nursery goes off and whacks another child you'll take your child aside and say don't you understand what you've done to that child look at how you've made that child you know cry you should feel you you've you've hurt that child and making that child your child understand the implications of their behavior on others on the emotions of others and so a lot of you know taking that forward quite some steps to looking at criminal offenders that's what we're trying to do with a lot of empathy interventions is teach people to understand the implications of their actions on the emotions of others whether that works or not so in this kind of empathy is this the one where um you can learn and make yourself better i think that's the the understanding is that you could you know through for example role taking um role taking um interventions where you have people you know in, um sort of act as if they're in a, a tense situation we 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 are in conflict with each other how can that be dealt with in a way that doesn't result doesn't result in violence how can what i um you know make sure that i don't um uh, or that i do take into consideration your your emotions in 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 moving forward so i think it can be done um and i think a lot of offending behavior programs are premised on that notion so the cognitive empathy is this the one which everyone is kind of uh, confused about that when we talk about someone who is uh, let's let's describe this trait as psychopathic someone we think oh it's a monstrous criminal and they lack empathy and there is no empathy in them i mean i guess some of your studies have found something bit well yeah i i think it, there is this divide we have um which i think is a, is a, is a is a clear divide between affective empathy experiencing the emotions of another person and cognitive empathy understanding the emotions of another person is a very interesting one for explaining the behavior of psychopaths because as you say most people would say psychopaths have you know no regard for the feelings of others they can do horrific things that we we can't understand as as people who aren't psychopathic but there are other elements of psychopathy um being glib superficial charming that's often associated with people who are psychopathic that actually require a fair amount of cognitive empathy mm -hmm. and we do know that some particularly psychopathic offenders have fantastic you know elevated levels of cognitive empathy so they are high, uh, equal to people who are not offenders or in some cases higher but their affective empathy is quite low that means they have a fantastic ability to look at someone and say that person is feeling happy right now i can use that to leverage what i want mm -hmm. and we've actually seen that in some of the research in which my empathy scale was administered to people on probation we found that people who committed robbery had low cognitive empathy and low affective empathy they just had low empathy mm -hmm. low empathy but people who were sex offenders particularly people who were child sex offenders mm -hmm. they had low affective empathy but their cognitive empathy was exactly the same or slightly higher 
than a comparison group we had. So they were using that cognitive ability, that understanding of how parents would feel, the proper things to say to parents to isolate the children, the right things to say to the children to get them alone. Those levels of cognitive empathy were just fine. Obviously, that lends itself to this question about then what are we doing providing interventions that increase um, empathy to these people? And, and I, I don't think that people have really considered the implications of that. Hmm. So it is actually counterintuitive that if you're trying to make someone better, and this seems like a amoral kind of a trait, which you can use as in your own advantage, or you can use it to make, like, maybe, I don't know, do things maybe better. And I think that's why most of the people who you see on the top is their, the characteristic kind of associated with them is a bit psychopathic because um, they can do very disassociated thing which can actually uh, be good for the whole group and they can do horrible things which is like bad for whole group but they get the power so i think i understand what you're suggesting and that, that is true i think obviously um one of the people who developed this concept of psychopathy the most his name is robert hare he's written extensively about executives who are quite successful i think i think the name of his book is snakes in suits yeah. and i think i think there is a lot there i think the the general conception about psychopathy is though it is it does have some elements of criminal behavior in it as well because although we've been talking almost exclusively about empathy we know that there are many characteristics that or, or risk factors that are associated with offending as well. And we need to be careful about giving empathy too much weight as the explanatory variable about what's explaining somebody committing committing offenses. You know, when we, we think about um, risk factors, those things that people have early in life that may make them more likely to offend, empathy is actually one of the ones that has been least studied. Hmm. So uh, uh, one that we know probably the most strongly related to later offending is being impulsive, so acting without considering the consequences of your actions. Um, and we know that impulsivity measured in so many different ways, and, and we can measure it the same way we might wish measure empathy with a questionnaire where we yeah. answer questions. The other thing that we do is a delayed gratification test. We've done that with kids, which is quite fun, mm -hmm. which is you say to a child, you can have this one suite right now, or you can have five suites when I come back in the room in 10 minutes. And the kids who consistently will not wait, not able to delay gratification, are much more likely to be offenders later on in life. Yeah, yeah. Is this the same marshmallow kind of test also famous for? Is this? It is. Yes. It is. Yes. Now, do keep in mind, I'm not suggesting that it's deterministic, <laughs> that those kids who take the one marshmallow, yes. and, and this is a very important thing to keep in mind, is what we're talking about here is, is the relative aspect. Those kids who... Um, take the, the single marshmallow and eat it right away, they're more likely than other children to go on to be offenders. It doesn't mean they're definitely guaranteed to go on to be offenders. So it's, it's, it's so it means that what is associated with future offending is more towards how can you control your impulse? And also how's your aggression maybe is shaped through your life. And that might be the more studied term or you're trying to say is according to research it is actually the in, main detector in, impulsivity what we know from prospective longitudinal studies and these are studies where we start looking at kids when they're six eight well before they're criminal offenders um, even studies where it has been done as early as j almost just after birth in new zealand for example they find that children who are under controlled mm -hmm. children who are more impulsive are much more likely to be offenders, particularly violent offenders, later on in life. We don't have a similar study with empathy, where we measure empathy early in life and and see how it's related later on. Now, all that means is we need to be careful about where we place empathy in our understanding of these things. But we know impulsivity is related, mm -hmm. as I said, and we need to then think about that when we're talking about empathy. If someone is impulsive, impulsive, can they be empathic if they act before considering the consequences of their actions? Hmm. How important is empathy? They may have very high levels of both cognitive and affective empathy, but this impulsivity overrides it. Oh, yes, of course. So it would. Yeah, this is a very complicated, subtle kind of a relation. Actually, I want to clarify two things. Sure. That's, that's it's just in my head. One. Um, there was a question, one of the researchers, his name is Gabor Mathe, he works with 
prisoners in Canada, if I'm right. I think he's Canadian. Uh, Gabor Mate. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a, he's a, I think he's a GP and also a psychiatrist. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if. So he said this statement and he's done a lot of work with addiction. Mm -hmm. And he's done a lot of work with recovery. And most of the, of course, people in prison has a lot of problem with addiction. And that's why some of the addicts end up in prison. And I think he mentioned that um, there's a huge majority of prisoners which we are actually sending a lot of people are traumatized children it's, and I, it just it just makes sense that maybe kids who are getting traumatized has an impulsivity problem because it there is a lot of research which just says that if you have frontal cortex there's a trauma there's a problem in controlling your emotional reptilian impulses do, do you think... I, I think there's a lot of evidence for that. Mm. I think, uh, obviously, childhood trauma is the start of, uh, of all sorts of problems that these children are likely to experience. One of the problems that we have from a, sorry, from a more academic point of view with this is disentangling all the potential factors. People, uh, people who experience childhood trauma also tend to grow up in poverty. They also tend to grow up in single parent families where they're not getting the parental supervision that you might might want. They tend to be less successful at school because of all of the issues that they have at home. And so all of these risk factors come together to make these individuals much more likely to commit offenses. What I can say about childhood abuse is that we know that it does have, it can have a lasting impact on the brain. As you say, the frontal lobe is particularly associated with abstract reasoning of which we would, we know empathy to be associated with. And so that may very well be the case. Okay. And the second part of that is pushing back um, our society to maybe tribal places. I'm, I'm not sure there's so much opinions about it, but as you were saying that um, highest level of ch highest chances would be like someone who is in young adolescence. I mean, eight, 17, 18, maybe some yes. someplace like that. So is that I mean, is that a characteristic of uh, male empathy, maybe where there is an in group? an out-group empathetic uh, properties where that's why most of the soldiers are young and that's why we might have been using our young children to actually you know go against the other group and be very empathetic well i think what we what we have what we're talking about there is something that's very famous is, is called the age crime curve ah. so we know that kids who are you know, 10, 11, don't commit many offenses, but kids who are sort of 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and then depending on the seriousness of the offense, it, it comes down. Um, it's also the case case with girls as well, although it's a little bit later and fewer women, fewer young young women become involved in crime compared to men. We do know it's it's normative to be involved in criminal behavior. In, the, in my PhD, when I was asking people about self-reported offending, and the offenses ranged from, you know, have you smoked marijuana to, you know, have you attacked someone with a weapon with the intention of, of hurting them or putting them in the hospital? Something like 94% of the kids answered yes to one of those questions, that range. So we know at age 14, 15, kids are involved in all sorts of things. I don't know if it's related to empathy specifically. There could be an element that people as they age, they develop more empathy, that understanding, and that results in people reducing their involvement in offending. Um, it could also be going back to this idea of impulsivity, that when people are young, they don't think through the consequences of their actions. And then as you get older and more mature and your brain develops, we know, of course, that especially the male brain doesn't fully emotionally develop now until about age 25, that hmm. after that point of time, people people go down. I'm not sure that I can explain, um, uh, but I think it's the similar sort of thing is associated with you know people enlisting in the military and doing all these things that it tends to be younger people who... Um, have fewer prospects perhaps and so we're thinking along yeah. those lines I mean this is a funny statement obviously I'm just going to make it because I've realized evolutionarily it could be that you have the capacity to suppress your empathy at a stage where you are physically the most fit to actually physically hurt someone else I mean it, it's I know I know there has to be some research done on well, this I can it, interestingly in my undergraduate degree as I said, there wasn't any um, criminology per se, 
but um, there was people who were interested in in evolutionary psychology. Yeah. Uh, Martin Wilson and uh, sorry, Margot Wilson and Martin Daly, um, who had written about homicide. So I I was very interested in working with them, and I did my undergraduate dissertation with them. Um, and that got me really exposed me to these idea of evolutionary thinking, and I can reflect on that with regards to empathy. I think what evolutionary psychologists would say is, we're, we are as we are humans living in the society now. Um, it's not how we evolved. We evolved in small groups, um, hunting gathering groups, and our psychology is is still designed in that way. And if you can imagine that, that makes empathy quite useful. If I'm looking at you and you show fear, that might mean there's a tiger coming oh, behind yes. me and I need to run away. So you can see why evolutionarily empathy is very important. Also, you know, the point of evolution is to move forward your genetics. So we all lived in small groups. We were very likely to be related in some way. So I would care for everybody in my group because I was actually passing along my genetics. Now we live in a society that's very different, but our psychology is still designed in that particular particular way. So it does create some interesting interesting complications. And and I think that is one of the biggest complications where Paul Slovic, he's the guy he he worked, and Paul Bloom, these are two yeah. people. I think they worked on they touched on this concept through that uh, evolutionary perspective. Now where we live, they say that I mean from one to eight people, from one person to eight people your empathy level goes way down because i mean i i think it's it's something some study like you can care about a girl mm -hmm. who you think is very attractive and you should save her and but if you increase the number to 100 it, it just becomes kind of like your empathy level goes down including that girl who you were caring one to one which could I don't I mean this is one of the research which I, I yeah I've 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 heard of but I haven't engaged okay. with Paul Bloom's okay. research. Um, I I think people stretch stretch empathy and the terminology associated with it for for all sorts of reasons. When we're talking about criminal offending, almost always we're talking about especially violent and sexual offending and those offending uh, those methods and types of offending that we think are most relative. Um, important for empathy. We're talking about people being within a certain physical space mm. to be able to experience their emotions. Um, now, um, fraud is such a common offense that it's actually not included in the crime statistics anymore. It's actually phys it's, it's t removed out of the crime statistics because it was making the crime statistics so high. So there's actually there's the, the crime statistics reported from the Office of National St Statistics separate fraud. But most fraud now is is online, so you don't you're not actually interacting with the victim. You're not seeing the impact of stealing an old widow's a hundred thousand pounds and her passing away as a result of all of the grief, because you're so far removed from it. And that's maybe empathy isn't great at explaining that. Although in in some of the research I did looking at fraud, we did see that people who committed fraud had very high cognitive empathy, yeah. so ability to to speak to someone on the phone and. Oh, you know, I understand that you'd be upset and nervous, but let me just make sure that you're not afraid of giving me your credit card details because I'm a really good person. Mm. And they could they could use fraud that way. They could use yeah. empathy to their increased level of empathy to perpetrate their offenses. Just just to yeah. just to like a last about this uh, difference between evolutionary and where we have evolved and now where we are. It could be that. Um, how it was supposed to be working in these small groups maybe the reason why um, some of the times empathy becomes actually a problematic things these days empathy and i mean the empathy where you actually feel the emotions of other people because whole sort of biases can come out of it like you might be too empathetic for your in-group and don't care at all about someone you think is outside of your group but the problem is now we live with all the groups and there is not really an in-group and, and, and a tribe or someone who's living somewhere outside. And the fraud might be one of those things that we think, oh yes, that is, I, that's not part of my, mm -hmm. so it's not included in your moral values. Maybe you are a very good person, but because this is just, uh, that, that's how you have evolved. So you don't even consider that to be a thing which you'll be guilty. Sure. Uh, there's a couple of things I can pick up there. One is, you're exactly right, we walk around <coughs> and, and bump into more people than, than we're, we were ever evolved to do so. Um, and if you had affective empathy with every, every person you saw on the streets in distress, you wouldn't be able to function as a human being. And actually, we've seen that 
at certain points, people who have very, very high affective empathy, can all, it, it's almost a form of personal distress. They experience everyone's emotions as their own, and they can't, they can't function. In that case, you know, oftentimes you, you'll, have, you'll encourage people to experience more cognitive empathy, understand that person's emotions, mm. but don't, don't, take it, don't take it on. Um, with the in-group and out-group, Again, we've seen people will show more empathy to those people that are similar to them. And that's been something that's been known for a long time. Margaret Bryant, who made one of the earlier empathy scales, she actually had two versions. She had a version she would give to boys, which would ask, how empath empathetic are you to boys? And a girl's version she would give to girls, because boys showed more empathy with, with, with boys and girls showed more empathy with girls. And I imagine it would be the same with all sorts of um, age and other demographic characteristics. People would show more empathy to those people that are more similar to them to themselves yeah I mean I had a friend and he actually sometimes when he was going through these kind of and he has a high level of empathy and now I know what kind of empathy he had and he was very interested in psychology he wanted to work with individual people and that's what all focus was but sometimes he couldn't go to the store <laughs> Because he says, I, I can't go to the store. And I say, I don't understand why you can't go to the store. Because he says, it just, there's a lot of anxiety, I feel like, and I, when I'm interacting with every one person. So he wouldn't, some days when he's sensitive, he can't go out of the flat because whoever he sees, he is just brought down. So in like half an hour trip, he comes back home and he's done. And now it makes kind of sense that. Well, yeah, that, that. Personal distress was something that's that can happen uh, with people who are very very empathetic, and they'll they'll take on everyone's distress, everyone's emotions, um, and not be able to clearly delineate what is theirs, mm. what emotions of those are theirs, and what emotions are there are those of other people. They experience someone else's sadness as their sadness. Um, they experience someone else's fear as their fear, and it's very difficult then to operate. Um, because you're, you're taking on so much of other people's emotions. Yeah, compassion, that's what Buddhist people say, love and kindness, <laughs> that, that's the way. So, coming back to prison system, I mean, we were talking about how we are measuring impulsivity and empathy, and yes, there's a lot of people who are in prison, maybe is poor background and lack of education. So, how is our prison system looking like? I mean, what is the demographic there? If you are putting a lot of people who just happens to be born in a poor place and are traumatized, it, it, it seems a bit odd that this is... Is, is, it, is it justice? Well, there's always two sides to look at these yeah. things. Um, you know, as you rightly point out, most people who are in prison have come from deprived backgrounds, the likes of which many of us don't understand in terms of the levels of poverty, the absence of proper parental figures, drugs, addictions, alcohol, um, very early in life. Um, you know, to a great extent, I think you could view people in prison as victims of, of the society that we live in. At the same time, most people in prison, no, I didn't say all, most people in prison have committed an offense that's pretty horrific. They've hurt somebody. They've done something very, very wrong. Um, and so I think the extent to which prison is the right response for that is something that, that we can debate. But I don't think you can debate that they have created victims as well. Although they, people in prison may be victims, they have created victims as well, and sometimes quite quite horribly. Hmm. Um, I think we would need to, to really think about what we want out of the, the, the criminal justice system. I think it was designed many hundreds of years ago uh, for different, different purposes and for different types of people and for different reasons. Certainly my experience of, of working in and around prisons are um, th that many of the people in there um, do have backgrounds that are, are quite horrific. Um, and prison isn't doing anything to ameliorate any of those issues. If you say that someone has committed an offense because, you know, they, they've stolen something, they've robbed someone because they're, they're poor or they didn't understand why that was wrong, then a prison system where you lock someone up in a cell for 23 hours a day isn't going to solve that problem. So you have worked a lot with... Um actual prison um, maximum security places is, is do you want to share something uh, about I have my first experience of prison uh, working in prison um, was 
I think it was 2001 or 2002, uh, where I was very fortunate to work again with David Farrington looking at whether a, a treatment intervention, an intervention or a form of intervention could be used in Whitemore High Secure Prison. Um, and in that particular case, we were looking at whether we could implement a randomized control trial. So randomly allocate some people to treatment and other people to not receive treatment. And the reason that we would do that is to really, it's the most robust way, it's the best way of testing whether that treatment actually works or not. And so we were going to randomly allocate people who had been labeled as dangerous and severe personality disordered offenders. And there's obviously a lot of technical issues that are involved in this sort of random allocation, moving people to, but there were, there were wings that were were being opened in this prison that we're going to use just for this. But that's the first experience I had of working with people who were in prison, looking at the prison environment. The one thing I'd say about my experience of high secure prisons, which is which is quite some time ago, is it um, is it felt a more controlled environment than some of the other what we would say lower category prisons. So a category B prison, which is a, a local prison, people go in and out for short term sentences, people are held there while they're waiting their trial. Those felt a lot less controlled than a high secure prison where someone is going to be for quite some time. Um, but in both cases, you know, the ultimate, the, the, the punishment tends to be, you know, people being isolated um, with the idea that I think historically that they'll consider the consequences of what they've done and won't do it again. So um, one of the projects, I think you were working something related with the detention center. Uh, yes, this is. Um, if you're talking about Jarl's yes, Wood, yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, again, I've been very fortunate to work um, in, in across a number of different areas, and this was a, a piece of research for the NHS looking at um, the impact of an a, a well-being intervention that was being done in Jarl's Wood. Now, Jarl's Wood is a um, is an immigration detention center, particularly for women, hmm. um, and it's it's again um, a place where where people whose um, immigration status is is suspect and so those people are detained in there until they're either determined to, that they can legally be in the UK or they're then sent back to whichever country they're suspected of, of being from um, and it is actually um when one compares it to prison it's a very interesting comparison because in prison people have committed a very clear or have been found guilty they have committed an offense and they have been cho their punishment has been selected by a judge that they should be put in prison for a set period of time. Whereas with immigration removal, um, an assessment of whether somebody is illegal or not illegal is not a dichotomous one. Um, I'm Canadian originally, as, as, as I've pointed out. I have an indefinite leave to remain. If I should happen to lose that bit of my passport, I think technically I would be considered, or I could be considered illegal. If my wife was then to find that piece of passport, passport, I would then be legal again. And I think it's difficult for people to understand, especially with the rhetoric about legal and illegal immigrants, that it's not a dichotomy. People are not illegal immigrants. They are, are people who their immigration status is pending. Um, what that means for the people serving uh, being, serving a sentence in Yarl's Wood is that the level of uncertainty is, is really not comparable to prison. Someone can be waiting for somebody to turn up their piece of passport to be let out. Somebody who is not meant to be in the UK can be waiting to be sent home. But oftentimes these decisions are being left with the home office and so people are just there waiting, day after day waiting, to try and figure out whether they are going to be sent back to a country where, where they may or may not have ever ever lived or whether they're going to be released to their family um, in the UK. And so the level of stress, even though the conditions appear better on the surface than prison, the level of stress experienced by those people in, in Yarlswood is, is, is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can relate to it. <laughs> I bet you can. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 yeah, definitely this is a lot of stress and trauma which can go through these places. So if you're talking about, um, I mean, yes, these institutes, I'm, I'm tempted to talk about this, but yeah, I mean, we understand that the government bureaucratic systems and our nations and boundaries, and I guess these um, places we are trying to 
strict people according to the quota. So you sometimes use power in a way where you're not really considerate. Yeah, from a from a criminological point of view, it really did open my eyes. I was more interested in, and involved because I, I do a lot of evaluations. So did this well-being intervention work? And it was very interesting because it was a, a mindfulness intervention that was standalone. So mindfulness is is there's a great deal of literature on it now. I'm by my very nature a bit cynical. So I thought, oh, mindfulness, you know, delivered 15 minutes to someone who is in such a level of distress. How could it possibly work? But in evaluating the, the literature, it, it really is quite amazing the impact that such a short bit of careful mindfulness can have. Um, research literature from the United States shows that people who undertake sort of 15 minutes of mindfulness um, regularly, um, people who are in prison, are much more likely to engage with drug intervention programs and much more likely to complete those. So that mindfulness, even though it's just 15 minutes, can really have a massive impact in terms of knock-on effects later on. And that was the case we also found at Yarl's Wood, even though it was an incredibly uh, potentially chaotic time for these individuals for them to have 15 20 minutes in a group or with an individual just practicing mindfulness really helped set them at ease it had a massive impact on the mental health of those there and it was considered really the jewel in the crown of of Yarl's wood in terms of what they could do to help people with this distressing situation so so mindfulness would be a practice which you do for 15 minutes and uh, does this mean, I know, I know, mindfulness means a million things, but would it mean that you are fundamentally putting attention to where you are? And I, I, As you say, there's, I, I, I believe it derives from sort of a, a Buddhist approach yeah. to things, but it really is just taking a moment, feeling your breath, experiencing the moment that you're in right now, how the breath is entering your lungs, how it's exiting your lungs, how wind may be passing by your your face, experiencing the feeling of your clothes on your body, and just taking time, instead of thinking about the 27 million things in front of you, taking 15 minutes to just experience what is happening to your body right now. Okay, yeah, okay, that's that's really interesting that even in the prison, which is a very stressful situation if this practice can work i mean i think we should all look towards it i, th I think we can and i think it, it would be something that would be be done you need to then think about the environment in which it needs to be to be given if if someone is afraid in a certain prison that if they close their eyes to focus on mindfulness for a second someone's going to steal their stuff or violently attack them then mindfulness isn't going to work so it's it's creating the environment which i think maybe maybe why um, it, you know, many people um, try to find aspects of religion in prison to g be able to leave their cell, to go to spaces of worship, um, to have that to have that time to focus on on themselves. So now we are talking about these institutes and who is there and who can be there and what is what are we doing to improve that? If you can explain, because I remember once we met, you talked about. What are the possibilities? And I think I don't think most of us really um, realize that what uh, what is the range of uh, people who are in jail? Like, how can you end up in jail? It could be a very trivial thing, and it's 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 very uh, scary. When you told me that that story, of, like, I don't know if it was a real story. You were just giving me an example. Do you remember? It was just someone. Oh uh, yeah. Punched. Well. When when you're working in prison, uh, the one thing I've found is it's very difficult to really get to what tr truth is. You will have prisoners tell you a story. You'll have prison officers tell you a story. But I have had, um, y you know, opportunity to look at, at case files as well and so forth. One of the things I would say uh, as I, where I would take this uh, discussion is to um, thinking about females in prison. Because there we have, I, I think in England, we have somewhere around... 3,000 to 3,500 women in prison. Keep in mind, we have about 86,000 men. So very few women in prison. But even there, I think the, the sort of offenses that women commit that get them in prison are very, very different. You'll have women in, serving time in prison for benefit fraud, for example. You'll have women serving time in prison for um, you know, being involved in drug distribution when it was their male partner who was having them carry the drugs or hold the drugs. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't women who have committed offenses that are worthy of prison, but I think if you're talking about sort of 
a level of seriousness of offending and resulting in prison, I think there's we, we would have a lot of scope to put very, very few, if any, females in prison. Um, back to the story, um, or, or talking about what people have told me in prison. You know, you, I have uh, had the opportunity to, to meet people who have committed horrific offenses on, on multiple occasions. Um, the story that, that you mentioned is a fellow who said that he got into a, f a fight outside of a pub, the fellow punched him, he punched the fellow back, that fellow fell over and hit his head and passed away, and so he's now serving time for manslaughter. I've also had um, a story relayed to me by, by someone working in prison because I met a, I met, I met a gentleman in prison and I said, Guys, he's really nice, he seems really, he's going to help us uh, recruit other prisoners for the, the work that we're doing, he seems a very nice fellow. What did he do? I know you're not supposed to ask this, but I was very interested. And the, the, um, the woman who was working in prison said, well, I think there's a suspicion that he didn't do anything, that he actually um, is taking the rap for his son. So there was some issues with gangs, some issues with storage of weapons being stored in a garage. And when the police raided and said, whose are these? This man has taken the prison sentence for his son. Again, to the extent to which it's true, yeah. we'll never know. But um, it certainly, he didn't fit the profile of the people that I'd been seeing in oh. prison so far. So over empathetic to the... Per perhaps over empathetic for his son, <laughs> yes. Okay, so... This is, I mean, you have, as, as everyone can see, you have a lifetime of experience in prisons and empathy. And I think it would be really interesting to know about the future of our criminal justice system, our prisons. Do you have something in mind? I mean, is there a way, a path you think would be a better, you know, if you can nudge ourselves towards that place? Well, I do. Um... Oh, I, 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 but I don't think it's, it's I, I don't think I'd be taking the credit for these ideas. I think what we have seen, what I've seen in my research and what we've seen other places, is that um, sentences that really focus on community options when they're available. So people that have committed very, very serious offenses, I do understand they, they'll need to serve some time in prison. But providing um, the support that probation uh, provides after after incarceration, or for those people who haven't committed offences serious of serious level, uh, probation is something that we know to be much more effective. So, I've actually taken um, done two pieces of research where we very carefully matched individuals up, some of who were sent to to prison and some of who were sent to probation. So these two individuals. They were the same age, they had the same number of previous convictions, they had the same index offense, so they both committed violence, for example. And in one of those cases, a judge or magistrate had said, you go on probation. In another case, an the judge had said, you need to go to prison. So what we see late, uh, is those people who are sent to prison are much worse off later on. They're much more likely to commit offenses, much more likely to commit offenses of, of greater cost and commit many more offenses than those people on probation. So a simple way of reducing reoffending would be to send more people on probation where they can receive the appropriate support. That's assuming, of course, that probation is appropriately funded and that's, a, that's another story altogether. So, I mean, it, it is very clear from our research and it is clear from other behavioral research that if you put someone in prison and particularly the kind of prison they would behave as you're expecting them or setting them up to behave because humans are as i think that are great imitators so we would imitate that kind of uh, what we're always with with research while we were talking about the average effect yes there may be there may be somebody who goes to prison and it, it is the moment for them and they never commit offenses again um, but what we're saying is on average if you send people to prison you know we have, we have very good evidence that sending people to prison makes people worse mm. that's that's not a question why it makes people worse and what we can do to mitigate that impact of prison is is still open for debate some people would say it's because instead of hanging around with your your friends that you usually hang out with you're hanging out with a bunch of criminals who are teaching you all sorts of criminal things to do the other is that it disrupts your relationship with your families that you lose your job and it makes it very difficult to get your job that you lose your housing and it makes it very difficult to get appropriate housing so you're much more likely to commit offenses offenses later on and it is very interesting to reflect that we have all these interventions in prison that will 
and, and we know that they work, these things that work on empathy, things that work on impulsivity, and they, if people that go on those are about 5 to 10% less likely to commit offenses than those people that don't. So we put people on those programs to mitigate the impact of prison. Hmm. Prison increases offending. These programs decrease offending. If we just didn't send people to prison, we'd be saving all sorts of mm. we'd be saving all sorts of money. Again, there's issues there about dangerousness and so forth that need to be considered because, you know, some people, as I said, need to should be in prison to protect protect society and protect others. Yeah, I mean, for sure, there are some people. There's just no no cure for it, and if you no matter where they are going, I mean, there's just cancer to the society. Let's let's put it like that. Maybe. Well, I mean, no, okay, yeah. There is there's an interesting again talking about this age crime curve. Up until two weeks ago, I would have said there is a cure for it. It's aging. As people reach fifty five, sixty, seventy. May, they're very, very unlikely to commit offenses, and, and I would have argued that till I was blue in the face. However, I am regularly exposed to, to you know, I would say the, the greatest criminologist, that um, David Farrington, who has been director of the Cambridge Study of Delinquent Development now for a number of years, and this is a study that started in the 1960s following up eight-year-old children up until now, he has criminal records for these individuals and they're, they're quite old. Um, and he was saying to me in a paper that's coming out in the next little while, that some of the individuals who are the most criminal at age eight are still doing things now at age 68, 70. Now keep in mind, these aren't people who are prisoners. Um, these are people who are just um, average everyday community people. So these aren't very, very serious offenders, but they are still doing things at age 60 plus. So there is some continuity of criminal behavior up until senior years. Okay, so this is now a question which bugs me and I would love to ask you that. Um, we don't understand the effects of genetics and how much that plays a role in what we are doing. Um, and that kind of a connection, if someone is eight and then now 66 doing it, I mean, does suggest something like that. But the question is, I don't remember, is it Charles, Man Charles Manson was a very um, popular case in America where he killed a bunch of people to get on the tower and then and then killed their wife and, and then went on the clock tower and killed a lot I, of people. I forget that person's name. That's yeah. not Charles Manson. No, 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 no. Sorry. Yeah. That, but someone else. Yeah. I remember something like that. And then he wrote a letter saying that I was perfectly fine. And then something starts to happen in my brain. Please do check my brain. And they did. And it seems like that. Oh, yeah. He had a brain tumor. So suddenly out of blue, he became this killer psychopathic person he says that i love my kids and wife and everyone but i just feel have i have this urge to do it i mean if you are someone who wants to go beyond and and we love as a human we love uh, to assign uh, responsibility to the action and of course it it should be like that because our society is based on it i mean this is the system we live in you do something, this is your fault. You are the person who is responsible for doing it. Now, as we are understanding genetics more, as more research is coming up and we are understanding that how much we are product of our genes and environment, something which your grandparent did would be somehow maybe possibility of having you. I mean, we trans transfer not genetically, but there's another way of transferring these traits. I, I forgot that term. Well, there's there's the some there's somebody's genotype. So yes. if you if you you take it and put it in a PCR, you can match up yeah. somebody with yeah. what somebody's genetics are. And the police will will use those sorts of approaches in their DNA analysis, for example. But how those genes express themselves yeah. can be influenced by the environment yes. Yes. massively. Yes. Um, and so you know, I may be my I may have genetics to be of a certain height, but because I grew up in Canada, where we ate all of this food that, uh, and I was, food was plentiful. I was able to grow even taller than my genetics, you know, or, or, or within an upper range of where my genetics, my genotype was. And I think it's probably the same with, with criminal behavior. Not that there's a gene for crime, but that we know that things like impulsivity may have a genetic element. Alcoholism may have a genetic element. Aspects of intelligence may have a genetic element. 
um, but how those are expressed. So you can imagine someone who maybe has a, 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 geno, a, a genotype to be, you know, to have difficulties with learning. If they are raised in an environment that, that really helps them in provides them with an enriching environment, they, they may be just fine. They may sh show no intellectual deficits at all for their entire life. Whereas those individuals who have a genotype for um, a learning disability, but um, are brought up in an environment that doesn't foster these issues will have a learning disability and that will have a profound impact on every stage of their life subsequently. They'll find school difficult, they'll find it difficult to get work, they'll be more likely then to be in a position where criminal offending is more of an option. So, yeah, okay, so I mean, the, the part of my question which confuses me is that we don't assign a responsibility to someone who is dying and sick and can't contribute in society because we don't say oh you have cancer so it's your fault although we do assign some sort of impulsive mm. i mean we say oh no you although it, it might not have been a person's own responsibility to be in that situation i mean no but, uh, it's interesting um I do know um, there's a fellow by the name of Adrian Rain who is a, a fantastic uh, biological criminologist. Um, he's, he's actually argued in court a case on the behalf of a defense of a man who committed a horrific, horrific rape. Um, and he put this individual in an MRI machine, was able to look at his brain and look at the childhood trauma that he'd suffered. And he raised exactly the question that you did, to what extent is this person responsible for all of those things that that happened in their lives? And to the best of my recollection, I think um, that individual, as a result of Adrian Rain's testimony, avoided the death penalty, hmm. uh, but was still obviously found guilty yeah, yeah. Of, of committing a horrific, horrific offense. So I think it's Robert Sapolsky. He's also a biologist, if I'm right. He, he done a lot of research with uh, chimpanzees or, or bonobos, I'm, I'm not sure. but. I think his statement is that one of the things which we would look back maybe in 100 years and we would regret and we would think that it would be like burning witches where we punish people for the crimes which we think they are responsible. And right now it, it doesn't make that much sense because I don't think we live in that society. So we don't have that understanding. We don't have that level of compassion or transcendent uh, ability to forgive people maybe in a way or we we do want some sort of vengeance we want i mean justice that's what we love to say that what it is i mean i'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we are going into that kind of understanding would we be able to even build our society in this place where i i yeah that's a difficult question i think that you're right people do want justice um, because they want understanding. They want to understand how a person could have done something so horrific. So many of the students I meet at open days come and say, you know, when you ask them, why are you interested in criminology? They will consistently say, because I want to understand why they did it. Hmm. What they're talking about is, why do criminals commit the offenses that we do? A and we don't know, and it's a very interesting aspect of psychology. Um, Oftentimes, we ourselves don't know why we do things. So it's not like you can go to a criminal and say, why did you do these things? Our, our research in social psychology shows us that we're very good at, at detailing what we did. So self-reported offending is actually a pretty valid measure of offending. So if you said, have you, have you hurt someone uh, with, the, with the intention of really, really hurting them, that, you know, people can make it up, but people rarely do. Um, and we find that it has some predictive validity. So if somebody says that, they're much more likely to have a conviction for a violent offense, a violent offense later on. So psychologically, we're very good at reporting memory things. What did we do? Not so good at the timelines, but very good at reporting what we did. When we get into why we did things, no, no. we make it up. And there's a whole stream of criminal, of, excuse me, of social psychology that will can show how people can be ever so slightly manipulated to give ridiculous excuses and explanations for their behavior. We are no good at explaining why even we ourselves do do things. So our ability to explain why somebody else has done something is probably even more limited. Yeah, it's striking me what you said about we want to understand. And I think this is one of the things which maybe I can improve myself or us as, as, as a society where we don't we, we should be maybe open a little bit more we because i 
mm-hmm. as you were saying I've, in this conversation i realize how much how less we understand about what prison system is how we are offending who is offending and what it what are the causes of course we understand it at some level but if we are maybe more open towards these uh, i think so i th- i th- I think there's there's so much evidence that we have that the most successful ways of addressing crime are by doing things with either pregnant mothers or very very young children. So there's very famous studies that have been carried out in the states where people who deprived mothers are provided with support, provided with additional childcare with um information about how to feed their children, how to um you know provide basic care and in consideration to their to their kids just to make sure that they're aware of 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 how to put their children to sleep and feed and so forth those interventions have massive impacts much later on in life those are the ways to address crime mm-hmm. by the time somebody is 15 and 16 and on the edge of going into prison it's very very difficult it's not impossible but it's very difficult to provide that individual with the support needed to not go in prison whereas we could by by focusing resources much earlier down the line prevent that person from ending up in that stage okay anything else you want to add to i i can't think of anything at the at the time it's been it's been interesting for sure yes 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 i mean i i from the bottom of my heart i loved it and it, it was very interesting even even while talking to you there was a lot of things which came in my own mind i mean all these questions about maybe how we can behave in our own way towards certain individuals to maybe we can we can spot certain people we can see that okay this is what impulsivity looks like this is what a behavior looks like and if you're as you're saying more open towards them maybe of course you you might not change the person but you might prevent them from going to this place which might be a uh, worse off i think what i've learned one of the the, the things i've learned is that in, in being involved especially in, the, in working in and around the criminal justice system is is just how profoundly deprived and difficult the upbringing of many of those individuals who are in prison are you know we tend to think of of ourselves and you know, oh we know people whose parents are divorced or so forth but the level of of deprivation um and what that means in terms of how people learned to interact with with others um you know they're making people who are 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 in prison or on their way to prison are making very rational decisions based on what their situation it may not seem rational to you or I looking at it from from afar but it's quite rational decisions from their point of view and so that level of understanding that we need to cultivate amongst people more widely about these sorts of situations tends to be presented in the press that this person did this horrific crime not that they were you know they didn't have two parents they didn't have much money that they were not successful in school that food was an issue when they were a child that they mm-hmm. were a child that they have really no they they don't feel that they have any likelihood of getting any sort of any future and it makes sense to steal someone's iphone yeah, yeah. okay thanks thank, thanks thank you very much. much that was amazing thank you so much